Hi, this is Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting video 12.1 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This video discusses about when and how to perform coronary physiologic assessment. Coronary physiology is the 12th of the 14 steps of percutaneous coronary intervention, and it is listed as 12th after access closure because it is not performed in all procedures. However, when performed, it is usually done after diagnostic and geography to determine the hemodynamic significance of lesions and help determine the target lesion or target lesions. And also sometimes it is being performed after PCI is completed to determine whether an optimal result has been achieved. So two main indications for physiologic assessment with either hyperemic or non-hyperemic indices. Assessing the hemodynamic significance of a lesion is number one and then assessing the post-PCI result is number two. There are two broad categories of physiologic indices that we measure in the cath lab. They are the ones in which hyperemia is used and the non-hyperemic ones. The ones with hyperemia, the most commonly used, is the FFR, or fractional flow reserve, which is defined as the pressure distal to the lesion that is usually measured using a pressure wire, divided by the pressure in the aorta, which is measured through the guide catheter. This ratio under maximal hyperemia, which is usually achieved giving adenosine, either intravenous or intracoronary, is the fractional flow reserve. There are multiple non-hyperemic indices, which are similar. They're the ratio of the pressure distally to the pressure proximally in the aorta through the guide, but they're calculated without causing hyperemia, and uh, there, is several, there are several of them that are measured during different parts of the cardiac cycle. For example, the IFR, which was the original non-hyperemic index, was measured during diastole, during the so-called wave-free period, but there are several other indices, both measured during diastole or sometimes during the entire cardiac cycle, such as the mean PD and PA. So we have two major categories of physiologic indices, the hyperemic and the non-hyperemic, with FFR being the most validated and the most commonly used hyperemic index. A cutoff, the cutoff is 0 0.80. There is also the contrast FFR because administering contrast has a vasodilatory effect in the coronary arteries. And the cutoff for contrast FFR for significant ischemia is 0 0.83. There are multiple non-hyperemic indices, both full cycle and then during parts of the cardiac cycle. And for all intents and purposes, those are similar. And the cutoff is 0 0.89 for all indices, except for PDPA, in which the cutoff is 0 0.91. The IFR was the first non-hyperemic index that was developed and actually has outcomes trial. However, all of the other non-hyperemic indices have been shown to be very similar to the IFR. As discussed before, the physiologic assessment can be done before the PCI or after the PCI. This is an example of crossover standing from the left main into the LAD, jailing the circumflex that has a lesion. Performing physiologic assessment, this is FFR with pullback, showing a significant step up at the origin of the circumflex, suggesting that this lesion is significant and requires further treatment. So coronary physiology can be very useful for assessing the severity of stenosis of jail side branches. It turns out uh, that uh, although geographically many of them appear to be significant, when a FFR is measured, only about a third or less than that are actually significant. If uh, the FFR or the IFR after the procedure is in the ischemic range, then the next step would be to pull back through the stent to find out why the FFR or non-hyperemic index is suboptimal. And there are several possibilities. One is that the step up is within the stent, in which case overpostulation is done or sometimes more stent is placed or it can be proximally or distally. If it is focal, then more standing can be performed, but if it's diffuse, then it cannot be treated and is often left alone. It turns out that approximately one out of four patients undergoing PCI who have their 
uh, non-hyperemic index, IFR measure post-procedure, has an IFR in the ischemic range, and in the majority of those, about 80%, there is a focal step-up, suggesting that it could potentially be treated with additional stent implantation or post dilation. Also, coronary physiology might be useful for planning coronary bypass graft surgery. What we know is that if a bypass is performed in vessels that have non-ischemic FFR, then the bypass graft occlusion rate is very high at one year, and the occlusion rate is much less with significantly ischemic target vessels. So how is physiologic assessment done? This is a step-by-step -step description or coronary physiology assessment, starting with the first step, which is to flush the guide catheter and zero the pressure wire. This is um, the pressure wire, one of them. This is the volcano pressure wire. It is taken out of the box and then it is flushed. Then there is a connection performed with um, the uh, PIM, the patient interface module and then the pressure wire is ready to be used. The pressure wire is then inserted, step number two, and advanced all the way to the tip of the guide catheter with the radio opaque portion of the wire protruding from the tip of the guide catheter because we do know that the sensor is at the junction between the radio opaque part of the wire and the proximal part of the wire. So the wire is inserted and then after we remove the introducer, which is a critical step, then the guide is flushed with normal selling, and then the pressures are equalized in the aorta. It is critical to actually remove the introducer from the Y connector, otherwise the introducer causes a pressure drop in the guide, which means that the equalization will not be accurate and the measurements will have to be repeated. So very important before equalization is performed to ensure that the introducer is removed from the TUI. Step number four is to advance the pressure wire distal to the target lesion. And this can sometimes be challenging because the pressure wires are not quite as torqueable as the non-pressure wires, but in the vast majority of cases, they can be delivered. The next step, number five, is to measure arrestic physiologic index depending on the system being used. For example, this is a PD as a plain PDPA that is 0.82, that is in the ischemic range. As we discussed before, the cutoff for all arrestic indices is 0 0.9, 0 0.89, with the exception of the PDPA in which it is 0 0.91, but clearly 0 0.82 is in the ischemic range. Also, it is important to do a uh, pullback and also to check that there is no dampening of the pressure of the guide catheter. This is an example of a guide catheter where there's dampening, and we can tell that because the waveform in the guide is ventricularized. And then, after the guide is disengaged, the form of the ventricular waveform is normalized, and now we can actually see a significant FFR. So the impact of pressure dampening is uh, adverse both for hyperemic and non-hyperemic indices. However, it is more pronounced for non-hyperemic indices. So before performing any coronary physiology measurement, it is critical to ensure that the guide catheter is slightly disengaged and that there is no dampening in the guide catheter waveform. Clearly, there cannot be a resting or hyperemic index more than 1.0. This is an example of artifact into the pressure wire. Therefore, this is not a valid measurement. And there are also another example of artifact in the waveform. This usually requires repositioning of the pressure wire, and then it subsequently resolves. And we can see here now that it looks good. This is an example in which um, uh, after standing, there is a, a measurement of um, the resting index, IFR, uh, into the circumflex and into the ramus branch, and that's non-ischemic, suggesting that we do not have uh, any significant lesion at the origin of those branches. The sixth step, which is uh, not often performed these days, is to perform a hyperemic index, usually the adenosine FFR, Again, this is not often performed because the arrestic indices uh, 
seem to work well for the vast majority of cases. However, if it needs to be performed, it can be done either with intravenous adenosine, with usual dose of 140 mics per kilo per minute, or with IC adenosine intracoronary. In the right coronary, we typically give 50 to 100 mics versus 200 for the left main. Giving adenosine can have adverse events. Specifically, it can cause heart block, as can be seen here, which can sometimes degenerate into ventricular fibrillation or atrial fibrillation. This is an example of an RNT phenomenon that triggered uh, ventricular fibrillation that required uh, defibrillation. And then the patient returned. But again, every time adenosine is administered, there should be careful attention to the EKG to detect heart block early. This is another example where adenosine causes complete heart block, and then the patient then goes into fibrillation that also required cardioversion for correction. The next step after we've done our resting and or hyperemic uh, uh, index measurement is to perform a pullback. And the pullback is critical because it helps localize the areas of pressure drop that potentially require treatment. This is an example of a patient that has um, a significant lesion into the circumflex branch to, to instantary stenosis. And the question is, should we just stand that? Or is there significant disease in the LAD as well that might mean the patient might require additional treatment? And this is an IFR pullback from the LAD, demonstrating that the IFR is ischemic with actual diffuse step up, which means that uh, surgery is the preferred treatment for this LAD and therefore bypass is the preferred modality. So having discrete step ups suggest areas that can be extended and improve. However, if it is diffuse and there is no specific step up, then stenting is unlikely to be successful because the entire coronary artery would, would need to be stented. This is another example of the LAD that has some diffuse disease but doesn't appear to be too bad. However, when we perform a non-hyperemic index, that's the DPR, this is 0.79, clearly in the ischemic range, whereas in the circumflex, it is okay. When we perform the pullback, we see there is a gradual increase uh, of the pressure. Therefore, there is no focal disease, and stenting is unlikely to be useful in this patient, who was eventually referred for coronary bypass. Some systems have actually a co-registration feature in which uh, the areas of pressure drop are displayed along the angiogram that facilitates planning of PCI in the areas that need uh, to be stented to provide uh, relief of the ischemia. Then the final step, which is a critical step, is to check for drift because sometimes there can be a drift on the pressure and therefore the, pressure, the measurements that have been obtained may be inaccurate. This is an example of a pullback, and then when we come back to the guide, there's still a gap between the two pressures. Those pressures, the aortic pressure and the pressure from the pressure wire should be identical. So in this same patient, there was a drift, there was re-equalization, the wire was re-advanced distally, and uh, the pullback was repeated. Now at the end, we have equalization of the pressures, which uh, suggests that we corrected for the drift. And actually, you can note how important this is, because this shifted the... Uh, FFR from 0 0.78, which is significant, into 0 0.85, that is not significant and does not require treatment of that vessel. So in summary, coronary physiology is performed for two main indications. The first is to check for the hemodynamic significance of lesions to determine whether revascularization is needed. The second one is after PCI is completed to ensure that an optimal result has been achieved and determine whether additional steps are needed for optimizing the result. Performing a physiologic assessment needs to be done in a systematic way, as outlined in these eight steps, with meticulous attention to detail. For example, the catheters, the guide catheters should be flushed, the waveform should be optimal, and there should be no dampening that can affect uh, the pressure wire measurement. And then always there should be a check for drift at the end because drift can affect uh, the accuracy of the measurements and provide erroneous results. These are some special scenarios when performing coronary physiology assessment. The first one is regarding aorto-ostia lesions. 
as engaging those lesions with the guide catheter can cause pressure dampening, which in turn can lead to a drop in the aortic pressure from the guide and underestimate the severity of the lesions because essentially the denominator, which is the pressure of the guide, is decreased. So before performing physiologic assessment of aortoostia lesions, it is critical to disengage the guide catheter to ensure that there is no dampened waveform. The second special situation is in patients with suspected left main disease. In those patients, there should be assessment of both the LAD and the circumflex along with pullback because if it is truly significant left main disease, there should be ischemic indices both in LAD and both in the circumflex and in the pullback, the step up should be at the left main. The third is regarding CTO donor vessels. What we know is that those vessels may have a more ischemic FFR because they are supplying also the occluded myocardium from, that is originally supplied from the CTO. And once you fix the CTO, there is an increase of the FFR by 0.03 to 0.10. Therefore, to assess the severity of the CTO donor vessel, it may be best, if possible, to first recanalize the CTO and then perform assessment of the donor vessel. Fourth scenario is when there is discrepancy between the rest and the hyperemic indices, and in those cases, clinical judgment is needed. Finally, physiologic assessment is not recommended in saphenous vein grafts because one of the basic premises or physiologic assessment is that non-ischemic native coronary lesions have very low rates of progression as shown in the deferred trial, and therefore there is no need for revascularization, but vein grafts are much more likely to progress. The second is in ACS culprit lesions because uh, in those lesions, the myocardium supplied by this vessel can be dysfunctional and therefore vasodilation cannot be achieved. Therefore, physiologic assessment should not be performed. However, it can be done in non-culprit lesions. Finally, the accuracy of physiologic assessment is decreased in patients with severe congestive heart failure because of the increase in intracardiac pressures. Thank you.